This is John Howell Essential Cuts, your daily rundown of the best of the best from today's show on 890 WLS. All right, the Tim Mapes trial has to wrap up by Friday. The judge said, that's it. We're all out of time. It's like a game show. I have another case beginning on Monday. So he told both sides, put your big boy pants on and get this thing done. And then I got to tell him that he's got to move on. He has no future in the house. Will you be wearing your big boy pants that day? So Mapes is caught on these wiretaps talking with McLean. Uh, the fact that uh, he did not know anything at all about Bob Rita or Lou Lang, it turns out, yes, he did know something about them. So this is no longer this is no longer me talking. I'm an agent, somebody that cares deeply about you, who thinks that you really ought to move on. And that is actually that's McLean telling Lou Lang it's time for you to go, according to what the speaker wants. Anyway, let's talk to our go to guy for all things legal. Andrew Stoltman is a Chicago attorney, also a Northwestern law professor. Uh, thanks so much for your time. I know that you've been following this, Andrew. Uh, first question is, in general, how convincing are FBI wiretaps in any any sort of um, trial like this? And how do, how do the juries normally react to these sorts of wiretaps? Well, they're huge because the jurors love to actually hear the voice of the defendant. And these are unedited. Uh, they are tapes. And, you know, historically, jurors have found those to be very, very persuasive. And that's why the prosecutors absolutely love them. You know, his attorneys say that um, he did his level best to provide truthful answers. He was questioned. There were several hundred different questions. Uh, They accused the prosecutors here, the feds, of asking open-ended questions and then failing to provide him, Mapes, with any materials that may refresh his recollection. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Look, these perjury cases are really difficult for prosecutors. Prosecutors usually win about 95 percent of the cases in federal court. But in cases like this, where you have a defendant who's 68 years old, who can say I was under tremendous stress. You know, I remember when Ronald Reagan once said, I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. (laughs) Uh, You know, that can be persuasive, especially to some elderly jurors who tend to make up the typical jury pool in federal court. And I guess that he was asked many, many questions, as I said, I think, you know, hundreds, and he's only been charged with lying uh, seven different times, and there's an obstruction charge that could put him away for 20 years. How careful do prosecutors, the guys who are in these uh, sessions with the accused, in front of a grand jury or not, how careful do they have to be while questioning the accused, knowing that the jury will hear the exchanges, and if they're too rough on the accused, the jury may be sympathetic? Right. They are walking a very, very tight balancing rope. Uh, And, you know, I think the prosecutors in this case are really kind of throwing the book at him to kind of send a message to other people who may be considering to cooperate that, look, you better be honest or we're going to absolutely hammer you. And, John, I think it's fascinating that we finally get to listen to some of the tapes during these grand jury proceedings, which we almost never get to hear. So this entire trial, it's obviously a warm-up for Mike Madigan's trial starting in April, but it's really been a fascinating trial for a lot of us. I wonder if McLean, who goes on trial with Madigan, he's already been convicted in the ComEd trial, I wonder if he's watching this and seeing how severely that uh, MAPES will be dealt with thinking about next April. Oh, absolutely. Probably him and uh, uh, Madigan are probably watching this case closer than anybody right now. So it is a little bit of a dry run, just a little bit of a dry run for uh, Madigan coming up. Can't Tim Mapes' defense lawyers, and maybe doing it as we speak, say he had cut a deal with the feds to be truthful? It's only after they went back over the, uh, uh, the verbatims of the testimony that they decided that he wasn't being truthful, but Mapes has said, well, if I already had agreed to be helpful to you, it was in my best interest to be helpful to you. Can't you just look at these seven instances as mistakes? Absolutely. And I think the defense is putting the prosecutors on trial and arguing what incentive would the defendant possibly have to lie or to not be truthful. And I think that's a pretty persuasive argument. He had the ability to, in effect, walk away scot-free from this. He did he didn't have the motivation to lie or not to be truthful. And I think that's a pretty powerful argument that might resonate with these jurors. How unusual is it for a US attorney to actually become a witness in his own trial? <laughs> I'd love it. 
how fascinating is that? You know, they're always on the other end asking the questions, but now they are being asked the questions. And I think it's always fascinating to see a prosecutor, in effect, on the witness stand, almost a mini little trial against him. Professor, is it unusual for a judge to say, we will be done by end of business on Friday? That's that's our goal. And it's not only a goal, I'm demanding it. Doesn't that put undue pressure on the defense? You know, I think it does put some pressure on the defense, but these federal court judges, they are many gods in their courtroom. And, you know, when they send their edict down that they want this trial done by a certain time, guess what? It's going to be done during that time frame. Are you always surprised at how openly these guys speak, especially corresponding emails from the same time period? They're very, very careful about what they're writing to each other, and yet they seem to be very loosey-goosey on the uh, phone. There's definitely a disconnect between those two, but I think these guys knew that there was a chance one day their emails could be evidence. I don't think they thought that their phone calls would be. So I think you see the true candor on these phone calls much more so than the emails. Like the big boy pants uh, line or the big, I'll go up and have a daddy talk with him from the previous trial. Yeah, that's it. Boy, you don't really see that in emails, do you? Tim Mapes confirmed outside the presence of the jury that he wished to waive his right to testify in his own defense. Is that a good move? Absolutely, because I I think the last thing he'd want to do is be put up there and be crucified by these prosecutors. And they are very good. They're federal prosecutors. They would put him through the meat grinder. So honestly, John, I think this is going to be a close call. The jury could, could, could convict on all counts, but it wouldn't shock me to see him found not guilty. How big of a hit to next April's federal case against Madigan and McLean would it be if Mapes walks? I don't think it will have much of an impact. I I think there's a separate set of facts uh, and a whole bunch of new evidence that will come in against Madigan that really hasn't been introduced here. I will tell you, I think it's a good dry run for the prosecutors who are just warming up and getting their arguments sharpened. That reminds me of that Al Pacino movie, uh, Scent of a Woman. Are you you finished, uh, Colonel? No, I'm just getting (laughs) warmed up. I'm just getting warmed up. Great movie. That's such a great soliloquy, and it's kind of a courtroom scene. That's right. Yes, yeah. it is. I mean, <laughs> it's like a movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Andrew Stolman, a Chicago attorney and Northwestern law professor, thanks for your time, sir. Much appreciated as always. Thank you so much. You're listening to John Howell, Essential Cuts on 890 WLS. That's Mike Emanuel time. Fox News chief DC correspondent. He'll be in the anchor chair Sunday at high noon, also Monday at 10 p.m. And he's a regular Wednesday afternoon guest here on the John Howell Show. On the Big 89. Mike, how are you, sir? Great, great. Thank you for having me, John. Well, thanks so much. Let's get to the, I think, the biggest news of the day. We love to talk politics, but this uh, this is a ricocheting around today. Putin apparently vaporized his main threat here, the Wagner mercenary chief, Prigozhin. What are you hearing uh, about that? What's the latest? Uh, folks here don't seem terribly surprised. Um, talked to a variety of officials who think, you know, that basically this was... Putin trying to send a signal to all of his critics out there that you cross me, you're going to die, um, and, and maybe a particularly painful death or, or sudden death. And so I don't think anybody in Washington is surprised. But um, and, and, I, and I think, to be fair, I don't think a lot of people are crying tears for Prigozhin because he's done a lot of, you know, a lot of the dirty work for Putin for years, so he's got blood on his hands. But um, but yeah, was, he's gone, and uh, two months after, I guess, his coup attempt. Apparently, and maybe this is incorrect, but when I was driving downtown today, I heard that there were two planes involved, and there was some uh, thought that perhaps the first plane was splashed in, uh, mistakenly, and that actually he was on the second plane. Is he confirmed a victim now? Well, that's a great point. So the confirmation we are getting is from Russian authorities. So I should put that qualifier out there. Um, So I don't think we know 100 percent for sure, but the Russians are saying that he was on the plane. Now, you know, not to be gross or graphic, but can you tell? I mean, it was, you know, a lot of flames and uh, impact. And so I don't know. But um, the Russians are saying it was him, but I should leave that, that question mark out there. Putin, normally, you know, somebody falls out of a window, oh, we slipped, or it was a suicide, or somebody dies of poisoning in London or wherever. This right. is very overt. Oh, absolutely. So I think it really was a, 
a message to his enemies, to his critics, saying, you know, I'm still in charge here, basically. What are you expecting from tonight's GOP FNC debate? And does Governor Doug Burgum make the stage? He tore, I think, an Achilles playing a pickup basketball game. Yeah, um, my, he told our crew out there that he blew his Achilles playing hoops. Um, a high-grade tear on his Achilles tendon last night. And so the recommendation medically is to stay off of your feet for a week or more, but he's not going to do that. So he's going to try to make a go of it. He did a walkthrough earlier today, and so our team caught up with him. Um, but, yeah, kind of a freaky thing the night before the first debate. And obviously all the Republicans running for the White House want to be on that stage. And so to have a slot and not be able to show up would be terrible, but um, it sounds like he's going to try to give a go of it. Brett Baer is terrific at this, obviously. So is uh, Martha McCallum. That being said, will they press these eight uh, GOP hopefuls on why Donald Trump isn't there tonight? I think they're going to, you know, definitely try to get them to mix it up. And so I expect um, that there will be some shots at Governor DeSantis because I think the rest of the field thinks he's kind of a a wounded number two at this point after his campaign has sputtered. I expect there will be some attacks on Ramaswamy um, because he's been Mr. Cool and he's gotten a bump in recent polling. And and I think that there are, there are clearly some folks irritated by his 15 minutes of fame. I got a text last night from somebody saying, you know, him acting like he's not preparing for the debate that he's just working out with his shirt off is a bunch of, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> is a bunch of bull. And so so I think there'll be some sharp elbows. I wouldn't be surprised to see Nikki Haley go after Ramaswamy on foreign policy, you know, because he's kind of like, yeah, you know, I could end the Ukraine war, snap my fingers. And, you know, he raised questions about 9-11. And, and so I think there are a lot of folks who think that, you know, as he's getting more attention, he started to slip a little bit. And so I think, you know, tonight there's going to be an attempt to Give him a good shove and see if he can handle it. If he takes his shirt off, will Chris Christie take his off? <laughs> As a man of a certain age, I think it's better if everybody keeps their shirts on. Vladimir Putin, presidential candidate, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> I concur. Mike Emanuel is here. He'll be in the anchor chair uh, Sunday at high noon. Also, you can see him 10 o'clock on uh, Monday night. Uh, the Biden impeachment could begin next month. If they provide us the documents, there will not be a need for an impeachment. So said McCarthy. What documents is he looking for? They're basically trying to follow the money trail. So I think any kind of financial records that the special counsel has, Congress wants to look at them to see whether the special counsel, David Weiss, is sitting on you know, prosecution or whether he's actually got the goods and ready to go forward. So I think they're trying to put the pressure on special counsel to move it along and not potentially run out the clock. Um, Look, McCarthy's got arguably the toughest job in Washington. Um, He's got, you know, certain rebels in his ranks that want impeach, impeach, impeach. Uh, Meanwhile, he's got probably 20 moderates or maybe more who, if they impeach, um, could be in jeopardy because their constituents back home, you know, could easily vote Democrat if they think the Republicans go too far. Um, I, and, you know, and there are some who are already making noise about if he accepts a lame government funding deal that they may go for his head. So he's got he's got the worst job, arguably, in Washington. And I think basically, you know, he's got to say, like, if if my guys want to go forward with this, I'm open to it. Now, he could keep the impeachment inquiry going for quite some time, run the clock on it, and maybe it just kind of slides into the campaign and kind of goes on the back burner while the campaign is in high gear. And then maybe we come back to it after November, you know, like one of those deals, like kind of show you're doing stuff, but it's not going very quickly. Knowing what you know about Kevin McCarthy, is he the kind of guy that would ever call Paul Ryan or John Boehner for advice or no? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think he's a very shrewd politician, and I think he has beaten expectations so far. I think there were some people who thought he might not make it through the debt deal um, from the, you know, after going 15 rounds to get the job. Um, He survived that. And I think there are a lot of folks who feel like he's played his cards, which uh, aren't many. 
uh, very well so far, but there's always another challenge around the corner. And so there's a government funding deal at the end of September. And, you know, if he calls Boehner and Ryan, they might just tell him, dude, why don't you walk out the door? We're the happiest guys in politics. Well, I'm so. sure if he did call either one of those guys, he'd have to make sure it's absolutely confidential. It, well, exactly right. Uh, so Did Nancy Pelosi think... ever have to deal with an insurgency like this, similar to what uh, Kevin McCarthy has to deal with? You know, my sense is she was looking over her shoulder at members of the squad um, because they were, you know, making noise about lots of stuff and maybe advocating some stuff that she didn't want to do. But I think she did a pretty brilliant job of of keeping an eye on them and keeping them in check and never letting that situation get out of control. I don't know how. I don't know whether she pulled them in and said, if you want to be kicked off of every committee, you know, keep it up. Or, or what it was, but um, I, I think she was cautious, wondering if they, you know, at some point they're going to say, "Hey, Grandma, time's up. You've had your time in the limelight." Um, but she managed to hold on to it long enough to walk off the stage after the Democrats lost the House. Is the House Judiciary Committee planning on holding its next field hearing here in Chicago? This is in September, I think, the twenty-fifth, focusing on violent crime and lawlessness. Is that what you're hearing? That's my understanding. And look, I think it's an opportunity for a Republican led committee to, you know, point to single party rule of one of America's great cities and say, you know, the way the recent leadership of Chicago has run the city has not been good for the people of Chicago. And so to draw attention to that, to try to draw a contrast as we head into election season for 2024. And this is kind of an intra party sort of story that really intrigues me. Uh, I guess Senator Ted Cruz, up for re-election in 2024, is holding a fundraiser with Senate Minority Whip John Thune in Manhattan in yep. September. Now, if John Thune wants McConnell's job, he would need Ted Cruz. This can't be good news for McConnell. My sense is is that most of McConnell's top lieutenants, John Thune being one of them, recognize he's going to be exiting at some point, whether it's after the 2024 election. And so there are three guys named John who want to replace Mitch McConnell. One of them's Thune, one of them's Cornyn of Texas, and one of them's Barrasso of Wyoming. And so far, they're playing nicely with each other. But I think this would be an opportunity for Thune, who has a lot more energy than McConnell at this point, to go meet some of the money people in Manhattan. Uh, because if he's to be the next Senate Republican leader, he's going to need to know how to raise barrels and bushels and <laughs> truckloads of money. So um, yeah. to meet the fi you know finance team in New York and to have Cruz's support going forward um, would be a good thing. And as the Senate whip, the guy who has to say, hey, guys, I need your support on this. Um, you know, it doesn't hurt to build better relationships with somebody like Ted Cruz. There's no way he'd do this without McConnell's either tacit approval or acquiescence, correct? I think you're 100 percent correct. Right. I think McConnell, you know, has probably told his top lieutenants, like, guys, I don't I don't have the energy that I used to have. And I've had some health issues. And so I need you guys to help with fundraising. And, and so I think. Um, there's been a, you know, either a tip of the hat or a, a wink or a nod or, or, you know, quiet, like, Hey, or I get you know, a piece. Yeah, you you can go, go raise, raise your money, money. I get a piece. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how'd you uh, shoot in your most recent round? Not well, John, I, 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 you know, was away for a couple of weeks. We were in the Greek islands. And so I hadn't picked up a club in about a month and, and just, you know, for me, it's all about confidence. If I feel like I'm hitting it well, then I, I hit well. And if I don't feel like I'm hitting well, then every every swing becomes kind of becomes kind of like, uh oh, what am I going to do now? So um, I need to put some work in. How about you? Well, I'm I'm off the grid for a while. I got a little foot injury, but once that gets uh, taken care of, I'll be back out there. But uh, do you do you hit the ball more like Rory or more like DeChambeau? Which <laughs> I wish. Yeah. So. So you and Doug Burgum have something in common. I hope I hope you're healing nicely. <laughs> I lost my Achilles years ago. Uh, thank you very much for your time. As always, we'll be watching tonight, obviously, 9 o'clock our time from Milwaukee. We'll see how it goes. And we'll watch you Sunday at high noon and Monday at 10 p.m. in the Anchor Chair. Thanks, Mike. Thank you so much, John. Take, Take care, care of yourself. Take care.
This is John Howell Essential Cuts on 890 WLS. The mansion tax gets Mayor Johnson's blessing with a few nips and tucks. Reading from Crane Chicago Business and my next guest, Mayor Brandon Johnson has agreed to a new compromise. Oh, that's a bad word, the C word, compromise, uh, on his proposed real estate transfer tax proposal. That's my redundancy, not uh, not my next guess. Uh, it's also called the mansion tax that would use a graduated tax approach. It's uh, good news, apparently, if you're homeless, not great news. If you own a mansion or commercial real estate, let's start there with Lee John Greco. She covers government, politics, policy, civic life, and the city's power elites for Crane Chicago Business. And I believe a first-time guest here on Double Dale. Lee, thank you very much for your time. Why the compromise and how is this going to work? Yeah, so basically um, a few weeks ago they were working this out at a hearing in the city hall, and uh, it didn't seem that the flat tax was going to be palatable for the business community. And there were some doubts um, from the housing commissioner that it was even going to be uh, palatable to, I guess we'll say lawyers. Uh, They thought that maybe it was going to be litigated uh, because that's what's happening with a similar mansion tax right now in Los Angeles. Um, So that is why I suspect it works out um, to the rate that we're seeing right now, which is not a flat rate, but rather this tiered system. And so the transfer tax on property sales under a million dollars would actually be lowered to 0.6%. Right now, I believe it stands at 0.75%. But then everything else, essentially, it's going to go up. So if you have a property between $1 million and $1.5 million, that transfer tax is going to be set at 2%. And then the transfer tax on property sales over $1.5 million going to be raised to 3%, which is four times the current rate. Not great news if you own a mansion or commercial real estate. I want to get back to that. In your piece in Cranes, you mentioned that they expect us to generate $100 million in revenue uh, for affordable housing and the homeless. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, that is a little bit below their original estimates um, when they have that flat tax. Um, they are looking at uh, giving us money to uh, what they call wraparound services. Uh, so that would include, you know, job training. It would help people get off the streets by uh, offering them rental subsidies um, or, uh, you know, subsidies for uh, development of affordable housing. Uh, so that's just, you know, a few examples of what they would like to do with this. In that original hearing, they also talked about, um, you know, counseling and health care. Um, so it seemed like they had some pretty broad goals for this. And as they, you know, refine the numbers here, I also wonder how that's going to work out in terms of uh, what they'd like to use the money for in the end. Also, the transfer tax increases would only apply to the buyer side with the exception of the first tier. And there's a lot of exempted properties. I'll, uh, I won't take your time up by going through that. People can read more at Crane Chicago Business. Now, what are the owners of big downtown commercial properties saying about this? They are already upset, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Uh, and my colleague, Danny Acker, spoke with them as well. Um, they are expressing um, a, a little bit of anger about this. Um, real estate developers are telling us that, you know, this is just another reason not to invest in Chicago. Um, and, of course, real estate agents spoke to us yesterday as well, saying that, you know, this is going to have ripple effects in terms of who decides to, let's say, buy a place on the Gold Coast after they retire versus maybe rent. Uh, so, you know, that's the argument coming from people in the business community, whether it's the commercial side or whether it's um, those high-end real estate agents that are, uh, you know, selling some of those places and in Gold Coast and and Lincoln Park that might apply here. Well, those people that have that kind of money, they're going to buy, they're going to complain, but they're going to buy. But really, the commercial real estate industry, with the amount of vacancies post-COVID, I mean, they have a tsunami just uh, over the horizon coming their way already, don't they? Sure, yeah. Uh, The vacancy rates are still pretty bad right now, so there is a question. uh, We're going to talk to the mayor tomorrow. Uh, There really is a question of, 
the best time to do this right now because commercial uh, real estate is still suffering post-COVID. You're originally from um, uh, Buffalo, uh, Lee. Are you rooting for the Bears or your Bills this weekend? Uh, I always have to root for the Bills, and that's not just because they're the better team. (laughs) I have suffered enough on one team, so sort of have to stick with them. It kind of feels like a Catholic tradition at this point almost. Have you ever thrown yourself off the back of a pickup truck to break a table like the Buffalo Mafia? You know, uh, I do consider myself part of the Bills Mafia, but um, I've always been a little wary whether my health insurance covers (laughs) table smashing. Uh, So I won't say whether I'm going to try that. I just started at Cranes. uh, So I I think I'll just watch for now and, and let the table smashing up to the rest of the Bills backers here in Chicago. Uh, Lee John Greco covering government politics and policy for Cranes. Thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. You're listening to John Howell Essential Cuts on 890 WLS. I got a chance to talk regularly with Ken Williams and Rick Hahn about 24 hours ago. They were cashiered by their boss, uh, Jerry Reinsdorf. Nobody saw it coming. Let's start there with Brett Austin Gogol, WLS's de facto sports director. And uh, Sox fan, uh, thank you for hanging around. We appreciate it. Uh, Brett, were you surprised at the news and especially the timing? I was a little surprised by the news and the timing, I suppose. We don't really have a timeline for when this would normally happen under Jerry Reinsdorf because it just doesn't happen. The guys have been in their positions for 10 and 20 years about. So I'm a little surprised that Kenny's gone. I think Rick is long past the point of having deserved to be fired. But, you know, he'd be... Jerry literally said he sees Kenny as a son. So that one did throw me off a bit. Well, fathers have fired sons before. I guess that's true. It happens. Yeah. You know, family businesses. Uh, what do you know about the assistant general manager? And apparently he's in the running to be bumped up, this Chris Getz guy. Yeah, Bob Nightingale reports that it's basically him. He's the head front runner, and you can almost expect him to be announced in the next couple of weeks. Chris Getz is somebody who played for the White Sox when he originally came up in the league. Then eventually went to the Kansas City Royals. He started in the Royals minor league department, and now he's kind of been the assistant GM slash running the White Sox minor league for the past couple of years now. Young guy. The problem is he kind of fits the profile of Rick Hahn, a guy who's come up in the organization, doesn't have a lot of outside experience except for the Royals, who stink. So I'm not exactly encouraged that we're going to solve the problem that currently exists in the organization by hiring somebody else inside the organization. I had forgotten that Getz played for the Sox. Mm-hmm. I do remember Kenny Williams as a player. How long ago was that? That's a long time ago. That was yeah. well before my time. Yeah, yeah. He might have been part of those teams in the 90s with uh, Big Frank and that great pitching staff. I don't recall. So Han had served as the Sox general manager for the last 11 seasons. Do you think he's gone because last year they had the seventh highest payroll in baseball, which, of course, didn't work out. Uh, or the fact uh, that uh, they have made the playoffs in a couple of years, they're expected to be a very, very strong team, or maybe just trying to bump the news off the front page that the White Sox now are rumored to leave Chicago in another five or six years. I think the biggest thing was just the failure as a general manager in general. You went through this whole massive rebuild. You sold off these pieces that fans loved in Chris Sale, Adam Eaton. You got back great prospect packages. You made the playoffs in 2021 and 2020, but you haven't won a playoff series since 2005. And I mean, I don't know how many other teams in baseball can say that. Six or whatever that is, 18 years, you haven't won a single playoff series. And the guy's held his job the entire time. Nobody else can say that in any other professional sports setting. So as much as I was confused by the stadium announcement, not announcement, but reports the other day, I could also see that one kind of being just state of business. That's probably about six years is when you'd start having those conversations. If you were going to leave or re-up your lease or make a new stadium or go to Nashville, that's about the timeline that that would happen anyways. Uh, That's just a southern suburb of Chicago at this point, Nashville. Yeah, I suppose so. Just a hop, skip, and a jump, (laughs) 10 hours down the road. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking that it's really just been kind of an internal they they're so bad after they were expected to run away with the division the past couple of years that even Jerry couldn't ignore it. Uh 6 years from now, 4 years from now, whenever they put a deal together, do they have to at least move to the suburbs because that's where the fan base is or northwest Indiana? I think I don't think they can. I think the fan base really does identify with the south side of Chicago. I don't think they can move anywhere north of Congress Parkway. Oh well, yeah. 
I, I agree with that. But the fan base identifies with the south side of Chicago. The fan base doesn't want to go to the south side of Chicago. I still think you can't be north of of 290 then. I, I concur. You can't be north of the I can, You I have concur. to be south of that in order for your fans to accept it. You can't move to... Arlington yeah. Heights or right. whatever the whatever the case would be. And it has to be a south not a not a southwest it has to be a south suburb. And I think that actually deters people because as many of their fans probably live in the north and northwest suburbs. As a Sox fan, I know there's no actual problem if you go to a Sox right, game. Not. You can go to guaranteed rate field and be more than safe. You can park there. It's a, it's, a, it's a lovely stadium. I, I think it's a, I think it's a great product. But I've I'm, always said that. But, but I'm not driving an extra half an hour to go to the south suburbs. But there's plenty of people who live there who would fill those seats. They you, would fill the seats. You say that. If it was Bolingbroke or Orland Park, I believe the Sox would have a sellout almost every night. Good, bad, or ugly. I think winning would solve that <laughs> a lot quicker. That's I can't, I can't give actual credit, but somebody said that. If, if the Sox had had just one strong decade where they had a 500 or better record for half the years, their fan base would be double because of how terrible the Cubs have been in recent times. Before before Theo Epstein came into the picture, the Sox could have really expanded their fan base if they would have tried a little better. Any possibility that Reinsdorf hires Hawk Harrelson to come back as general manager? <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go with no. I think Hawk is perfectly happy being in the Hall of Fame and sitting back and probably yelling at his own TV at home at the umpires. He he wants a second chance. That one year wasn't enough. Just uh, you know, bring Chris Getz in. But if you're gonna if you're gonna do that, at least you know, bring Ozzy back or something like that. Get a real hard ass in the clubhouse. Yeah, I'd love to see Ozzy come back. I think he still would come back if given the chance. Uh, thank you, Brett Gogol. Thank you. Oh, no! He was safe at first. No! No! Now Hawk doesn't do that on TV. He does that towards his TV. He's... Oh, no! No! He was safe at No! First. No! How about Ozzy as a new GM? That's a good idea. He'd love to go back to Wrigley. I, I never say anything bad about Cubs fans. I never say anything bad about... Cubs organization. I just hate Wrigley Field, and they have to respect my opinion. And I guarantee you, everybody in the media in Chicago hate to come to Wrigley Field, and they don't have the guts to say it because they might lose their job. John Howell, Essential Cuts. Check back every weekday for another episode of John Howell, Essential Cuts on 890 WLS.